Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Emerging Conversations event. I apologize for the link issue that we had. Uh, I expect that some folks will start coming in uh, as we proceed, but I don't want to hold things up any longer than necessary. Uh, I'm Ginny Van Dusen, Associate Director of Alumni Professional Development here at Emerson, and I'm glad you could join us. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. To minimize background noise, all attendees are in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom window. Following the presentation, our speaker will answer your questions for as long as time permits. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Pat Payton, class of 1984, is founder of The Intelligent Body, an international speaker, and co-author of the award-winning book, Physical Intelligence. Pat has more than 35 years of experience partnering with world-class organizations to drive performance improvement for audiences across diverse industries, global theaters, cultures, and platforms. Her consulting and coaching is designed to help enhance performance for individuals, teams, and organizations, transforming lives and cultures through active management of our physiology. Pat, welcome. It's so good to have you here. You have you here tonight, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Ginny. And I'd love to have you turn my. Can we turn my video back on? There we go. And I encourage everyone who's joined, if you're comfortable, to please turn your videos on. I'd love to see your wonderful faces because we're gonna be doing some exercises and it's really great to be with you today. We're gonna to dive right in with a question about making your body work for you. And Ginny, if you wouldn't mind sharing the first poll, that would be great. So, what we're really looking for here is how often do you think about the inner state of your body in terms of a per percentage wise? How often day to day are you aware of that? Don't overthink it. What are we seeing, Jenny? I can't see the poll responses. Here we go. So 50 to 75%, that's actually above average, which is terrific. We do have some people in the 25 to 50 and a few in the 75 to 100. So I will say that this is an above average crowd, which is not a surprise for Emersonians. I know we might have some non-Emersonians, but especially in this field, and we'll talk about that a little more, we tend to be more aware of the inner state of our body. But over 50% of the people that we survey are in that 25 to 50% range. So if you're there, know that you're not alone. That's where most of the people that, the thousands and thousands that we've surveyed, that's where they live. And we asked this question as part of a survey on how physically intelligent someone is. So that room for improvement that you have, whether you're in the 25 to 50 or the 50 to 75 range is really all about primarily when we dig down into those numbers in the survey, people who need help sleeping better, managing anxiety, being more resilient, letting go of things and learning from negative experiences, increasing their creativity, managing energy levels, being motivated and performing well under pressure. So those are some of the things that people say they need help with. Today, we're going to focus on managing stress, avoiding burnout and boosting energy with the time that's left. Let's see how we do. I can go longer. I don't know if everybody else, if everyone else can. By the end of our time together, I hope that you'll have a greater appreciation for your body, this amazing piece of technology that we get to walk around in every day. We don't all love the outside, but we've got to love that inside because it keeps us going. And also a better understanding of how we can help other people manage their anxiety, their burnout, and their energy levels. This is going to be a practical, physical, interactive session. So I hope you have some room to move. Look around. If you don't, clear some space. And feel free to adapt any of the movements to suit your own body, especially if you're working with an injury or a, a disability. There will be time for Q&A, I hope, at the end. So please submit questions via chat to Ginny as we go along. She'll gather those and we'll talk about those. And that, again, is something that I can stay later and talk about and you can write to me anytime. 
After this session, I will send a summary of the main topics that we covered and maybe some we don't get to because of the late start so that you don't have to take copious notes, but you might wanna have something that you can jot a note down on because from time to time, I'll ask you to make a note of certain things to help you build your own physical intelligence and life hack, life hacks that will help you enhance in these areas that we're talking about. So let's experiment now with one movement. Do this with me, stand if you're able to, stand up. And I'd love to be able to see you again, no forced fun, no pressure, but I really would love to see you because then I can coach you a little bit. So do this with me, stand up if you're able and put your arms out to the side and then raise your chin a little bit and imagine that you have a string attached to your sternum, pulling you up and forward. Your arms are gonna move a little bit behind you when you do that. Think of Kate Winslet on the bow of the Titanic. That's really the pose. And now relax into that and take a couple of deep breaths from we're going to talk about diaphragmatic breathing in a minute, but we want to try to do it diaphragmatically if you know how to do that. And relax and push that stretch a little more and do it one more time. Have that string pulling you forward and up, okay? So we call that taking flight. That's an easy way to remember it. And if you, I don't, I'm going to, I'm actually going to cut the question, which I was going to ask you to chat in how you feel, if that, if that feels any differently to you. There is no right or wrong answer. Some people feel more open. Some people feel happier, more expansive. You can feel anything. It's, but here's what happened. With that one simple movement, you stimulated 40,000 independent neurons in your heart and the surrounding muscle to release a key chemical called oxytocin. You might be familiar with it. If you aren't, that's okay. We're going to talk about it. It's our social bonding and trust chemical. It's essential for social bonding and trust. It, in, it increases our ability to connect with and understand the world and people around us. When we fall in love or we have children, massive amounts of oxytocin are released, but we benefit from it every day at home and at work. You can also boost oxytocin by massaging your heart just through your skin, you know, just massaging your heart like that petting your pets if you have them, or through physical contact. So if you've ever felt like you needed a hug, that was your body telling you that you needed some oxytocin. You know, when COVID first started, uh, there's a great story out of London that when COVID first started, there were six young professionals living in a house in London. Four of them went home to their families to spend lockdown with their families. Two were left behind. They weren't especially good friends. There was no romantic involvement. They both worked in their rooms all day. And over time, they realized that something was missing. They felt isolated. And what they decided to do was to give each other a 20-second hug at 6 o'clock at night every single day. So what was missing for them, that thing they felt was missing, was oxytocin. So that is a, it's a very important chemical that we need to keep boosted to create that inner state where we can more easily connect with and build trust with other people. If we feel frustrated with someone, if you can release oxytocin, it can shift your state of mind to one where you're more compassionate. If you feel isolated or you feel like giving up, you feel dejected, oxytocin is going to increase your hope and your optimism. It can give you a completely different mindset, a different set of thoughts, because there is a two-way street between the body and the brain. The, we know that the body, the body believes the brain, that it follows the brain, but just it's just as true that the brain will believe the body. So that's why just the simple massage of the heart, that stretch, petting your pets, giving someone a hug, actually changes your brain chemistry. So what does all this have to do with managing stress, burnout, and energy? If you wouldn't mind sharing uh, the next slide, please. Ginny, there's some really fascinating research that was done by a neuroeconomist called Paul Zak. He has measured oxytocin levels in thousands of people all around the world. People who work in high, oxyto high oxytocin cultures have 106% more energy, 76% more engagement, 50% more productivity, 29% more satisfaction with their lives, 13% fewer sick days, and 40% fewer cases of burnout. 
And you can see the, the stats on that right on the slide there. And you see Paul Zak credited. His book is called The Trust Factor. I find this research fascinating and compelling for us as individuals and also for leaders. If any of you lead people or lead teams, who doesn't want more of all of that? So oxytocin is key. Trust and shared purpose in, an, in a business environment and a home environment help create that oxytocin too, so that we can achieve all of those incredible results that he has found from interviewing thousands, tens of thousands of people in every culture you can imagine all around the world. So this is just one of many chemicals that influences our performance. We can stop sharing that slide if you don't mind, Ginny. To achieve our goals, it's important to actively manage this, what I call a chemical cocktail. It is cocktail hour. So we're gonna talk about this chemical cocktail. So it powers our performance, whether we are talking about managing anxiety, burnout, or our energy. Now, energy is the main currency of our life. The executive function of our brains carried out by the prefrontal cortex is very energy hungry. In fact, brain activity as a whole consumes up to 20% of our energy, of our body's energy, more than any other organ. And for many of us, <clears throat> our work and our studies require significant and sustained brain power, which means we're draining those energy batteries on a regular basis. We're really putting our brains to work. And one of the least effective ways to increase that energy is to live in a state of anxiety or to spend time right here where we are right now in front of a screen, right? Those both drain our energy. So how can we boost energy and manage anxiety and burnout while we know we have to work in this environment where we're stuck in front of these screens? The answer is a type of intelligence that most people don't fully understand or leverage. Some people have never even heard about it, and that is physical intelligence, which is the title of the book that Ginny mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk. Physical intelligence is our ability to detect and actively manage the balance of certain key chemicals in our bodies and brains so that we can achieve more, stress less, and live and work more happily. Right now, there are literally hundreds of chemicals, neurotransmitters and hormones, racing through each of our bodies in our bloodstream and our nervous system. These chemicals largely dictate how we think, how we feel, how we speak, and how we behave. All emotions are chemicals. They're strands of proteins, neuropeptides, that arrive at receptor sites in our brain and our body, and they set off a chain of events, different reactions for different emotions. The swell of pride, the grip of fear, that burst of joy, all of those are different chemical reactions. The particular kind of energy, energy, uh, emotion actually means energy in motion. The particular kind of energy depends on that cocktail of chemicals driving our behavior at any given moment. Most of us live at the mercy of these chemicals. We experience waves of thoughts, reactions, and emotions without realizing that we can strategically influence them through how we move, how we breathe, how we think, and how we interact with each other. And while the term physical intelligence may be new to you, there are over a hundred physical intelligence techniques. We're only gonna look at a handful today. Most of them have been used for decades. They're drawn from multiple disciplines, including elite sports. So the, those elite athletes, they all know these. The martial arts, if you practice martial arts, some of these may be familiar to you and the performing arts. So I have a feeling that some of our Emersonians are, gonna, are going to know some of these techniques. All of them are well supported by neuroscience. And based on that neuroscience, we know that physical intelligence doesn't just sit alongside IQ and EQ. It actually underpins them. It lifts them up. The stronger our physical intelligence, the stronger our our intellectual or cognitive IQ intelligence and our emotional intelligence. Conversely, if we're not living a physically intelligent life, we are not getting the most out of our IQ and our EQ. So the physical intelligence curriculum is built around four elements, all important for peak performance. Strength, meaning inner strength, confidence, resolve, appropriate risk-taking, driving change, standing our ground, speaking wisely and decisively without threatening others or feeling threatened. That's the kind of strength we're talking about, inner strength. 
not necessarily this kind of strength. Flexibility is also about uh, not necessarily being a contortionist, although that would help. Flexibility is all about creativity, innovation, collaboration, adapting to different communication styles and behavior styles, embracing change. The third is resilience, which is just what we all know it is, bouncing back from setbacks and disappointment, but we're gonna talk about an aspect of resilience that might not be obvious if we can get to it. And then finally, endurance, which is sustaining effort over the long term when we need sustained motivation and energy. That's what we mean by endurance. So resilience and endurance, self-explanatory, strength and flexibility, a little bit of a unique definition there. Sitting alongside those elements are these chemicals that I've been talking about that can, that there are several of them. There are hundreds in our body. We don't wanna to touch all of them. Some keep our hearts beating, but there are eight chemicals that we're gonna talk about today that we can and should want to mention. And Ginny, if you would bring up the slide with the, with the axis, that would be great. The performance pathway. We're gonna focus on these eight chemicals. Some may be familiar to you, others unfamiliar. Each of them has a signature feeling or role and they all play a very important part and they need to work together well in order for us to succeed as well as we can. So on the slide, you see the vertical axis. This is our activation scale where the chemical adrenaline, which is our fear and excitement chemical, that gets us going and acetylcholine helps us recover. You're probably all familiar with how adrenaline feels in your body. The primary function of adrenaline is to increase our heart rate and blood flow, enable that fight or flight response. It releases energy quickly from store, stores of carbohydrates and fats so that we can have that burst of energy run from whatever is trying to attack us. Very, uh, you know, rooted in, you know, Neanderthal instincts, right? It's an ancient deep instinct, this adrenaline. It gives us the energy to meet new challenges, but it can sometimes speed us up or lead us feeling overly excited or nervous. And that makes it difficult to communicate succinctly or think clearly. Our brain waves become chaotic. So simply shaking out your arms or legs like a runner about to start a race, that will help disperse adrenaline. That's a pretty well-known technique. Acetylcholine is our balance chemical. That's responsible for energy renewal, recovering from all of that pressure, recovering from fleeing from whatever was trying to get us. It also is responsible to, for, recovering from, for recovering learning and memory. It brings our heart rate back to normal after some intense activity, and it restores the, body, the balance of our body overall, something called homeostasis. And this is true for all types of intense activity, whether it's emotional, mental, or physical. So it's not just recovery from running a marathon. It's recovering from an emotionally draining experience or something that was mentally challenging. If you want to quickly relax and stimulate acetylcholine, take a hot bath with Epsom salts. It's that simple. Your skin is going to absorb the minerals in the Epsom salts that will help produce acetylcholine, and, and you'll also absorb magnesium and potassium. Your energy is going to come flooding back, and you'll also sleep better. So this is the activation scale, pretty familiar to all of us, but what really impacts this is how we're activated. And that's, if just click, if you would, Jenny, just do a click. That's what really matters here is how we're activated. And you see on one side, cortisol, which is our threat and stress chemical on the right, and DHEA, which is our vitality and stamina chemical on the left. And you can also see where how you're activated, whether you're in, under adrenaline or acetylcholine and activated by DHAA or cortisol affects how you're feeling. So it's important to note, because it looks pretty bad here, the cortisol is not all bad. It literally gets us up and out of bed in the morning. And along with adrenaline, it facilitates that fight or flight response. So stress managed correctly can be an engine of peak performance. We need it. It's when it gets to be too strong. We move beyond eustress, which is possible, which is positive stress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E eustress is a good thing. We want that. But when it gets to be too high, when cortisol goes too high, then we're in trouble. So that's when, just do a little click, Ginny. You see, when cortisol gets too high, it pulls down 
all of the levels of our four high performance chemicals, dopamine, which is our pleasure and reward chemical, oxytocin, we just talked about, social bonding and trust, serotonin, our happiness and status chemical, and testosterone, which is our power and control chemical. So when we get too stressed, cortisol is too high, all of those other things drop. In comparison, if you click again, Jenny, you can see that if we're activated by DHEA, all of those same peak performance chemicals are boosted. So our aim in life is to live on the left-hand side of the grid. As a dancer, I like to say shimmy over to the left, right? So we wanna shimmy over to the left-hand side of that grid because that's when you're really living a physically intelligent life. Now, DHEA is a very strong performance enhancing steroid. It, the synthetic version is so powerful that it's a banned substance for Olympic athletes. But we, and we, we definitely don't advise you to take it. Don't take it in synthetic form. And you don't have to because you can make it yourself every day. We're going to make some in a minute. So increasing DHEA enables that movement over to the left side of the grid. And when we do that, as you can, as we just said, all of those other peak performance chemicals come flooding into our system and we can take on all of life's challenges. I see a question. Oh, people are, more people are joining, welcome. Don't worry, we're gonna send the deck out and the recording so you can get caught up. So when you look at this grid, think of it like a balance sheet. If you're living on the right, on the cortisol side of the grid, that's the equivalent of a debit in your physical intelligence bank account. But if you're living on the left, that's a deposit in your physical intelligence bank account. You're strengthening your ability to perform at peak. So with this grid in mind, we don't have time to do it as a group because of our late start, but think about where you spend the majority of your time. Is your PI balance sheet in the black on the left-hand side or in the red on the right-hand side? Make a note of that and ask yourself how soon you wanna be living more often on the left-hand side of the grid. And then after this session, I encourage you to think about what might be getting in the way of moving to the left, shimmying over to the left, and what steps can you take to remove some of the obstacles that are keeping you from getting there. You're going to leave here with a number of tips and techniques that you might use to help you help accelerate that movement over to the left. So let's start by first looking at the first pillar of physical intelligence, and that's strength. And Jenny, if you wouldn't mind taking the slide down, that'd be great. Just if you stop sharing, there we go. So strength, as we said, this is again, inner strength, confidence, resolve, appropriate risk-taking, not bodybuilding. So for this kind of strength, we need DHEA, testosterone, the right amount of cortisol and dopamine. So testosterone gives us risk tolerance and confidence. DHEA is our vitality and stamina and dopamine gives us focus and direction. If you think about Usain Bolt and that movement, that movement actually gave him a shot of dopamine every time he does it because specific combinations of directional movement and visualization release dopamine. So we need all of those DHEA, dopamine, and testosterone boosted to keep cortisol at that optimal low level. So how can we do that? Well, the first is to start, start boosting DHEA. I am going to skip the poll Ginny, I'm gonna skip poll number two, and I'm just gonna ask you to think about this. How aware are you of your breathing patterns throughout the day? Are you regularly aware of it? And do you monitor it? Are you occasionally aware of it? Are you only aware of it when you realize you're holding your breath, your breath is too shallow, or do you not think about it at all? And believe me, that's possible. We had someone say to us once, what do you mean focus on my breath? Doesn't it just happen? Yes, of course, it does just happen but it can happen more efficiently if we do focus on it. So breath work is the starting point for how we can hack into our nervous system and make the kind of physio physiological changes that we're talking about. With breath practice, people have accomplished incredible things. There's a, a Dutch journalist and an extreme athlete named Wim Hof. He's used breath practice to control his internal body temperature so that he can endure the extreme cold. In fact, he climbed three quarters of the way up Mount Everest wearing only a pair of shorts. We're not gonna try anything that ambitious tonight. We're gonna to start with a very foundational technique that might be familiar to some of you. It's called paced breathing. And this is physical intelligence 101. This is the foundation. 
everything builds on this and the next technique. But if you don't have these in place, nothing else will work. So paced breathing. Uh, if you can, if you share that slide, Ginny, or maybe if it's if it's clumsy or, or difficult, don't worry, I can just speak to them. But in this, in this study out of South Africa by Dr. Justin Kennedy, 100 investment bankers uh, took this study and they practiced paced breathing for 40 minutes a day, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening for 21 days straight. And they had three coaching sessions. By the end, they experienced a 40%, 42% drop in stress and 62% improvement in cognitive function on complex decision-making tasks. So lower stress, higher cognitive function, simply from dedicating time to paced breathing. I'd be thrilled with even half of those results. So that those results really motivated me to increase my dedication to paced breathing. As I mentioned earlier, the brain consumes up to 20% of our energy, our body's energy, which means that paced breathing will also help with your energy levels because it's going to enhance that cognitive function. And as you likely know, it's the very first thing to do when you experience anxiety. So, and it also produces, as we said, that precious DHEA, that key chemical that's gonna enable us to live on the left. So let's, you can take the slide down now, Ginny, thank you. So let's start working on paced breathing. It begins with diaphragmatic breathing. So show of hands, you can raise your hand or raise, just raise your hand if I can see your face. And if I can't see your face, raise your hand on the screen if you know what I mean by diaphragmatic breathing. You see a few people saying that they know what diaphragmatic breathing is. If you don't, it's perfectly fine. If you sing, you probably know what it is. So to breathe diaphragmatically, again, stand up because it's, you can obviously we can breathe when we're sitting, but it's easier to, to learn how to do diaphragmatic breathing if you're standing up, right? So first put one hand on your chest, and I don't know if you can see, and then another one on your, on your abdomen and take a breath and your breath in, the hand on your abdomen should move more than the hand on your chest. We don't want to see this kind of breathing where the chest is moving up and down. You wanna just push your belly out. Don't worry about what you look like. So that's what I mean by diaphragmatic breathing. So that's the way we have to be practice paced breathing, but once you have the diaphragmatic, once you have the diaphragmatic breathing in place, I'm gonna layer in the paced breathing. So to breathe in a paced breathing is all about breathing diaphragmatically in a smooth rhythmic way, breathing in and out in a regular ratio. And Jenny, there is a slide on this. I'll keep talking while you pull that up. So you wanna breathe, breathe in and out in a regular ratio, counting your in and out breaths. Don't push or pull the length of your breath. Just figure out what rhythm feels comfortable for you. You might choose an even count in and out like four and four or an uneven count in and out like five and seven. It's completely up to you. You can count as fast or as slow as you want. You're figuring out your pace. Now, if you feel especially stressed, aim for a longer out breath, that, that uneven count because Carbon dioxide is heavier than oxygen and it tends to build up in the base of our lungs. And when CO2 builds up, it spikes our cortisol. And we already said that when cortisol spikes, we're living on the right. You wanna live on the left. You wanna produce DHEA, get the carbon dioxide out of your system. So find a count right now that works for you and try to keep that rhythm going throughout the session. You'll probably forget, you'll get distracted. That's okay, just like meditation, just start it again. And as you're doing it, remind yourself that you're, you are actually creating DHEA. You are releasing DHEA into your system, which is this magic performance chemical that Olympic athletes want and they aren't allowed to take it in synthetic form. So absolutely, this is foundational for physical intelligence. Now, while the bankers, you can stop sharing. I'm just gonna read this. Okay. Uh, while the bankers did 40 minutes a day in two 20 minute chunks, if that feels too ambitious, start wherever you can, two five minute chunks a day. I, I, and if you meditate, do it while you meditate. You'll have a head start. 
because that's a great opportunity to incorporate paced breathing into your day. I do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, and I meditate. So that gets me to 35 minutes. I meditate for 15 minutes. So I'm at 35 and I can easily pick up the remaining five while I'm making a cup of coffee, waiting for a Zoom call to start. You can, these don't have to be, this, these don't have to be done all together. They are accumulative. You can fit them in wherever they work in your schedule. And eventually it becomes second nature. You might want to post a reminder to yourself in your workspace, your study space, add it to your calendar to keep it top of mind. And remember that research, reduce stress, enhanced cognitive function. That motivates me. I don't know if it motivates you. And while this sounds simple and it is simple, don't confuse simple with unimportant. These techniques, many of these techniques that I'm gonna share are very simple and vitally important. Breath is life. So enjoy your breath practice and the additional focus and energy it will give you. Working hand in hand with breath is posture. It's another foundational concept. Good posture literally creates room for our lungs to expand. Yet so many of us spend our days shaped like a cashew in front of our screens, right? You know, you know the, the pose, whether it's the big screen or the little screen, we're hunched over. That literally impedes our ability to expand our lungs and it keeps that carbon dioxide trapped in the base of our lungs, which we just said spikes our cortisol. So work on posture with me for a second. Whether you're seated or standing, make sure your feet are rooted to the ground hip width apart, drop your shoulders down. We're not gonna put them back. Just drop them down. Imagine that you have weights on your elbows, holding them in place. At the same time, picture those shoulders floating away to opposite sides of the room. And then imagine a string suspending you from the, from the center of your head, suspending you from the ceiling. If we have any ballerinas here, they will be very familiar with that because that's how ballerinas maintain their posture. If somebody were to tug on that string, it should not lift your chin. It should lengthen the back of your neck. And when I can see all your faces, I literally see your heads get closer to the top of your screen when you do this. Because you're gonna, you actually can grow a couple of inches by lengthening your spine that way. With that posture in place, keep up your paced breathing. And now we know diaphragmatic and paced with that posture in place and you're breathing properly. I'm, I'm debating because I, I, can we do a quick show of hands who can stay longer? Because I don't know what to skip. There's one thing I really want to get to. Sam can stay. Why don't, should I keep going, Ginny and um, Christine with the plan? And then we can send this whole thing out to people who have to drop. Yes, yes. That's a good okay. way to do it. All right. So I'm going to keep doing, I'm going to keep going. So we're going to layer now into this posture and breathing, a visualization. And this is really important. Visualization is important for anxiety and energy because centering, we're going to do a, a high-powered centering technique. It reinforces the chemistry of high testosterone and low cortisol and supports our dopamine function. It ensures that our neural pathways fire efficiently so that we can focus, coordinate our physical and mental en energy, and ultimately achieve and win. And it also helps us feel like we're more in control, which reduces anxiety. So here's the technique. Picture a capital letter I, you know, with a bar across the top. This is a serif font, not a sans serif font, right? So we have a bar across the top and the bottom and that line in the middle. The top bar across the top should run from shoulder to shoulder, across the bottom from hip to hip, and the line in the middle right down the center. So see it in your mind's eye. You might wanna close your eyes. See it in your mind's eye and really feel that eye in there. It's going to give you some structure right away. And using your imagination, decide what you would like your eye to be made of to give you the kind of strength we've been talking about, inner strength, confidence, resolve, et cetera, et cetera. Visualization is also important here because the visual cortex of our brain plays such a significant role in releasing dopamine. The more vivid and personalized the imagery that you can put in this eye, the more potent the visualization will be for raising your performance. So keep visualizing your eye, close your eyes, keep them closed, let your Im imagination run wild. And it can be made up of anything you'd like, whatever you think is gonna be a source of strength. 
It could have special features, you can engineer it. Now, if you have trouble visualizing, then just jot down some words that you think would apply to what your eye would be. And keep visualizing. I don't wanna rush it, but I know we're tight on time. So if anyone's ready, think about now how having that eye in place will give you strength and notice how it makes you feel and how it makes you hold yourself. It might make you feel more present in your body. If we were in person together, I could demonstrate how much stronger you are. So I would have been able to push you over the biggest person on the call. I'm a pretty small human being. Uh, I'd be able to push a tall person over if they didn't have this in place. But with this in place, the largest person in the room can't move the smallest person. It's pretty amazing, this, the power of this visualization. If you're ready, chat in what your eye was made of. I'll just look at a couple. Let's see if we have any. Does anybody have an eye they want to share? If not, I can share some that other people have come up with over time. Bamboo. Oh, I like that one, Christine. Natural, strong, quick growing. So it's, isn't it fascinating? I've had people say that they, uh, it was pink silk, bright pink silk. Other, another person said that it was all of the members of her family. That's, that's where she draws her strength. So her eye was made out of different members of her family. One of our, and it's interesting too, because you can have different eyes for different occasions. So we have a client who's a quant genius, math genius, working for one of the banks. And he doesn't like going to social events. He doesn't like all of that chit chat. It makes him uncomfortable, it feels superficial. So he created an eye just to prepare him to go out to those events. And it's a tower of champagne glasses overflowing with bubbly so that he can be effervescent and move around those parties and, and feel more comfortable. So my eye today is very different than my eye if I'm sitting and writing. My eye today is like a, an iridescent, uh, it's not even a, I don't even have a name for it, but it's, it's glowing and there are rays of sun coming through it and connecting to each square on the screen. And I have my mother here and my grandmother here and my husband holding up the whole lot. So that's, you know, again, I don't need that eye when I'm sitting and writing, but I need it when I'm worth all of you. So you can use these, you can create a wardrobe of these eyes and you can use them flexibly. So speaking of flexibility, I'm gonna to touch on this quickly. You know, when we ask people how much daily movement they get, above and beyond the regular fitness sessions, most of them tell us that they're too static for most of the day. And this is important because even if we work out for a full hour every day, if we sit still for more than six hours straight, our mortality risk increases. More for women than men, they don't know why, but that's the truth of it. So as the saying goes, sitting is the new smoking and that's no joke. Sitting is also negatively impacts our flexibility in PI terms, in physical intelligence terms creativity, innovation, collaboration, agile thinking, embracing change. So it's very important to be physically flexible because that's going to enhance our mental and our, and our emotional flexibility. A rigid body leads to a rigid mind. The key chemicals for flexibility, oxytocin we've already talked about, DHEA we've already talked about, dopamine and serotonin. So since we've already talked about the other two, let's focus on serotonin. That's our happiness and our status chemical, but it also plays a key part in the suppleness of the connective tissue between our muscles and our bones. So if we're sitting too long in one place and not moving, we're going to impede not just our own physical flexibility, but our mental and our emotional flexibility. So with this chemical Con, with, that, with this chemical cocktail in place, we can change and adapt with grace and flex to other styles of communicating and behavior. We can learn new things. We can spark new ideas. We can be more versatile, move more expansively and freely. So 95% of our serotonin is produced in our gut. We release it when we move, especially when we twist our midsection. So if you're golf or you practice yoga, you're way ahead of the game, right? This is, you have a head start. Twisting at the waist 
couple of times every day is very important, especially again, if we're spending time in front of these screens. So you wanna make sure that you move this part of your body. And when you do think about the fact that you're releasing serotonin, you're actually boosting your happiness and your status chemicals. Research tells us that spontaneous, I'm not gonna ask you to share slides, Ginny, because I, I know we're really tight on time. But research tells us that spontaneous free movement enhances our capacity for divergent thinking. There's a fascinating study by Dr. Dance, and you'll read about it when we send the slides out to you. Crucial for innovation. And you may know a well-known study out of Stanford that found that we're 45% more likely to have an innovative idea while we're walking versus seated, even if we're just walking on a treadmill. And that's because the, the opposite arm leg movement, you know, our right arm, left leg, left arm, right leg movement. So swimming, uh, walking, running, all of those move, all of those practices have that opposite arm and leg movement. They facilitate faster connections between the right and left hemispheres of our brain. So that's what sparks the creative ideas. That's why we have those better ideas while we're walking or running or swimming versus sitting down. So think about which of your meetings can and should be conducted while you're walking. So what does all of this have to do with anxiety and energy, which I said at the beginning we were gonna focus on? Living on the right-hand side of the grid can cause physical discomfort and pain that comes with too much anxiety or fear. We're literally in the grip and cortisol levels are too high. Our muscles get very tense, they use up energy with no benefit, and again, energy plays a big part in creativity and, in, and innovation. That's hard work, and it's often risky. We have to be determined. We need a clear head, which takes us back to paced breathing. If you've stopped, please start again with that paced breathing. And we need energy and vitality to sustain us through the highs and lows of creativity and innovation. So these flexibility movements used strategically will benefit physical, mental, and emotional functioning while sparking our creativity and innovation. There's a great TED talk by Wendy Suzuki on exercise and the brain, and I'll include a link to that in the follow-up document. Movement in general has a profound effect on us. It changes the way we think and feel. It releases energy if we feel tired. It calms us down if we feel overwhelmed. And when we free our body, we free our mind because the body and the brain are inextricably linked. So Descartes had it wrong. There's another technique called a body scan, a map of tension where you scan your body and figure out where you're holding tension and then do techniques to release that tension. And where you hold the tension can tell you things about, about yourself. For example, if, you're, if you have tension in your gut, that might be an indication of guilt, insecurity, or personal anxiety. If it's in your jaw, that you might be holding back on saying something. Lower back tension usually indicates feeling a lack of support. There's a long list of hot spots, tension hot spots, and what they might mean in our book. So I won't go do it with you now because we don't have time, but think about that body scan. And then that takes us to resilience. And this is the one that I really did want to spend some time on. So if you have a few minutes, hang in there and do this with me. So once you have strength and flexibility in place, it's time for resilience. And as mentioned, resilience is our ability to bounce back from adversity and conflict, developing and maintaining that learning mindset, remaining optimistic and constructive, even in the face of failure. And it's important to note that by focusing on strength and flexibility, you've already improved your resilience, but there's even more that we can do. So there's, um, and I think, you know, right now with all that's going on around us, we all need some resilience. The past few years have been challenging. COVID, George Floyd, supply chain issues, the war in Ukraine, political strife, Roe v. Wade, inflation, will it ever end? So we all have something to bounce back from. Those are just the big things out in the world. In our own lives, we also have things to bounce back from. And we need that increased, we have an increased need for resilience. So. I don't know if we have time for the poll. Ginny, what do you think? If you think so, put up poll three.
answer quickly because people are dropping like flies. <laughs> These are just good questions to consider for yourself, regardless of how everyone else is answered, but are you generally feeling stressed and worried in overdrive or fatigued? How often are you feeling calm, enthusiastic, happy and content? What are we seeing, Ginny? Okay, we don't have anybody really in that 70, well, in, in the 75 to 100, which is good for feeling stressed. And we have a good number there for uh, feeling content, enthusiastic, but I still see uh, you know, I still see a good chunk only at 25 to 50%, which means that there's room for improvement. And that's okay because no one is at zero and no one is at 100, including us, including the practitioners of physical intelligence. So you're not alone. Uh, I'm just reading the note. Carolyn, thank you. We'll talk to you soon. So you're not alone. And when people take our PI survey, this is one of the areas where they really need help. The good news is it's very easy, relatively easy to build resilience, meditation, massage, good nutrition, hydration, sunshine, developing a learning mindset, processing negative events so that you can get them behind you. All of those things boost our resilience. We recommend making a list of all of the people and things in your life that support and restore you. Those are your resilience resources. Now, the best time to build resilience is before you need it, but it's never too late to start. I actually think of my body as a resilience tank with the water level in the tank indicating how resilient, how much resilience I have. At the beginning of COVID, it was coming out of my ears. My resilience was up to here because I'm living a physically intelligent life all the time. But during COVID, by August of 2020, it was down around my ankles because I was up till two or three in the morning, night after night, converting all of our training curriculums from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual. My husband had a knee replacement. I couldn't find food. We live in a kind of remote area of Arizona and there, were, there was no food. So there was a lot of stress. The tank was empty. And I have had to work diligently over the past couple of years and it is almost back to pre-COVID levels. So it takes time and it takes a very concerted, diligent effort. Uh, so I'm scrolling forward in my list. Our resilience really depends on well-functioning adrenal glands. So you've heard about them. What they do is they keep us, they sit on top of our kidneys and they decide how much energy we need, needs to be released to meet whatever demands we're making of our body. When we lack resilience, our adrenal glands struggle to cope with the pressure we're putting them under. So we need them to keep us going at pace, but too often we ask them to do that without giving them enough time for recovery. Remember the vertical axis, the acetylcholine, right? So it's like driving a car with our foot flat on that accelerator, slamming on the brakes, accelerating again, not servicing the car. That car is going to break down. The same thing will happen with our bodies if we don't take care of them. So part of resilience, and I think this is what not everyone understands, an important part of resilience is stopping and giving yourself time to recover. It's not just about bouncing back like a like what are those, those, those uh, punching bags that bounce back up? That's not resilience. You need some time to stay down so that you can bounce back. And that's absolutely essential if you're going to be resilient. So time for recovery, essential component of resilience. You cannot bounce back if you do not give yourself time to recover. And remember, good food, hydration, meditation, massage, sunshine, processing ne negative events, applied strategically and diligently and consistently. That tank is gonna be full before you know it. All of that will keep cortisol at an optimal low level and allow acetylcholine to come flooding into your system, support your learning, your memory, your immune system function. And when that happens, you're living on the left-hand side of the grid. There's a quick acronym that you can use to remember resilience. It's called REST. There's a slide on it, Jenny, but don't go crazy if it's too hard to find it. The R stands for retreat. Think about the tennis player that puts the towel over their head. What we're talking about is taking a couple of minutes every day, every day to be in retreat from all external stimuli, including the phone, including social media. You are just sitting in silence 
with no outside distractions. We need that. It's a good time to practice your paced breathing. The E is eat. Of course, I mean healthy food. No surprise. We want you to eat healthy food. That's lean protein, plenty of veggies and fruits, whole grains, keep sugar, alcohol, simple carbs to a minimum because they make your body toxic. I mean, I have, I have ice cream on Sunday and I have pizza once a month. You're going to come up with your time when you can have the bad stuff, but for the most part, eat the good stuff and stay well hydrated. The S is for sleep. This is a huge topic. We could spend the entire talk on this topic. It's always one of the biggest challenges that people face when they take our survey. It has a greater impact on cognitive function than any waking activity. And remember, the brain is the number one consumer of energy. I call sleep my silver bullet. Study after study after study says seven to nine hours a night. If you have young children or lots of schoolwork, you're rolling your eyes at me. Uh, for some of you, it may, not be, it may not be possible. That's okay. At least know what the ideal is and where you can work toward inching up those hours. For example, go to bed a few minutes earlier each night, sneak in a few naps if you have children or a partner, uh, take turns sleeping in on the weekend. You know, not everybody has to get up with the kids at the same time. Sleep quality also matters. So you wanna to go to bed at a similar time every evening, keep your bedroom at 65 degrees. That feels cold. It took me a while to convince my husband that this was important. While you sleep, the cleaners come in. The glial cells vacuum up the waste products in our brains so that we can literally wake up clear headed. They also repair the myelin sheaths that insulate our neurons so that the signals can be transmitted faster when we're awake. I'll date myself, but I think of these things as Pac-Men, cleaning up my brain and rebuilding my myelin sheaths. And that motivates me to get to sleep so they can get to work. And then finally, treat. Here, we're not talking about chips and candy bars. We're talking about restorative treats, a hike, a bike ride, playing with the kids, reading a book, taking a hot bath, listening to peaceful music, whatever restores you figure out what those healthy treats are and replace the unhealthy treats with the healthy options. You know, there are gonna be times when one or all four of these things fall out of your schedule. I recommend looking through your calendar and in several places each week, writing rest. Who knows which one you're gonna plug in that spot, just write the word rest in all caps, even if it's a small window and then honor those windows. I actually insert it in more windows than I know I'm gonna be able to use because invariably if you get nibbled away, but don't let them all get nibbled away. And if you lead a team, remember to give them permission and space to do the same thing. So those short windows could even be used to do a twist at the waist, to do some paced breathing, to do a quick retreat, whatever you need most in that moment. So those are all credits on the PI balance sheet to keep you in the black and live on that left-hand side of the grid. There's something else that reduces our resilience, and that's when something's weighing on our mind and that we need to let go. This takes about seven minutes. So I'm gonna ask Christine and Ginny. I feel like we should, I don't, I wanna, I wanna respect all your time. Do you wanna do a seven minute exercise that helps you let go of whatever's weighing you down and then wrap up, or do you wanna wrap up now? We can ask everybody who's left. It's fun, it'll end with music. Okay, we're, we're going for it. So along with lack of sleep, letting go of things that weigh us down is one of the highest ranked challenges in this survey. Letting go of things, whether they're big things or little things is absolutely crucial. And we generally can let go of those little things faster, but the big things tend to hang around, they come back into our mind, they pull us down, we ruminate, so we're gonna work now on this technique that helps us let go. And it's especially helpful with more challenging issues, those things that we do ruminate about. So take a moment, think about something that you really want to let go of. It can be a frustration from yesterday or something you've been carrying for a while. And you might wanna write it down, you don't have to, but, but think about it. And then to let go, you first need to retreat. So obviously you can't leave the screen, but just clear away if you've been if you've been multitasking and checking email move all of that away all right so you're going to retreat and then that helps you de-stress become calm boost acetylcholine and then you want to reflect 
we're going to do this fast, but you can do it more slowly after the session. You want to reflect with real cognitive power and scrutiny and face up to what happened and take time to understand it. This is going to boost testosterone. Just facing up to it increases your testosterone. And then you might need to get feedback. If there's someone you know who lived through this with you, even if it was peripheral, ask someone you trust, ask for their feedback. Purposefully boosting our oxytocin levels because we're reaching out. Even if we feel like keeping it all to ourselves, talk to your mentors, your coaches, your friends, your colleagues, managers, et cetera, and leverage that support system and make sure you connect with people who will challenge you, not people who are going to let you get away with bad behavior. For example, they can help you prepare for some difficult conversations. After you get that feedback, learn lessons. Oh, I'm sorry, Ginny, just click forward up to learn lessons. Okay. Uh, we need to learn lessons, but that reboots our serotonin. We own it. We learn from it. This is the most resilient mindset possible. We've done something that maybe didn't work out well. We're crushed. We lost the promotion. We lost the sale, whatever it is. Let's figure out what we can learn from that. And once we've done that, then it's time to move, to flush out the chemistry of negative emotion. As I mentioned before, Emotions are chemicals, these strands of neuropeptides. They can get stuck in those receptor cells, like the wrong key gets stuck in a lock if the feelings aren't expressed or if they linger. Frustration and worry, they linger. So moving and punching out or shaking out to dislodge the stuck neuropeptides literally helps shake those stuck chemicals loose. And then finally, you're going to move forward. That's the last one. So on the next slide, we're gonna walk through that shakeout process together. And then when you get this deck, you can follow the whole process, but we'll practice the shakeout. We'll skip endurance. We'll go right from shaking it out to wrapping up. So do this with me now. Try not to feel too self-conscious. I'm gonna walk through it. And then after we walk through the bullets, we can click one more time for music, but not yet, Ginny. So standing or seated, you want to fold forward from the waist just as far as is possible for you. Relax your upper body, especially your neck. So let your neck hang down. I'm coming to look at you on the screen. That's why I'm, I'm poking my head up again. And while you're down there, take a deep breath in and then exhale. On the out breath, vigorously shake your shoulders. And if you can, verbalize with an ah sound. You won't be able to, I can't hear you, but I'll do it. Ah, ah. It sounds really weird. <laughs> Normally you're doing it alone. I am bearing myself for you, all right? And you wanna repeat that and keep shaking or punching. Shaking, and I mean shake all of your, your limbs. Try to get your head beneath your you know, beneath your knees because you want to invert your spine. A lot of those precursors get stuck at the base of our spine. So you really want to shake your body very vigorously, let yourself go. And then at the end, you're going to roll up slowly, stacking those vertebrae one at a time with your head coming up last. And we're going to talk about how you feel, but click one more time. And when the music starts, I want to see those heads go down and I want to see some shaking and punching. Okay. Oh, but did it not go back one? When you clicked, the music won't play? Darn it. We're gonna do it again anyway. Just, it's supposed to be sing it to yourselves, shake it up, baby, right? So just bend forward, really let yourself go, shaking those limbs, shaking your legs, punching out if you prefer, right? It doesn't have to be shaking. It can also be punching. But all of that negativity, all of those chemicals trapped in those receptor cells are getting shaken free. They're all getting shaken loose. And then slowly roll yourself up, stacking your vertebrae one at a time. And then your head comes up last. And if you've really done it well, you should feel a little happier, a little more focused, a little freer. And you might have to do it more than once, depending upon how heavy the burden is. So for example, 
if you've lost a loved one and you re it's really dragging you down, one time isn't going to do it. Be honest with yourself. Stay with it. Stay with it. Now, once you roll yourself back up, visualize this thing that you've been shaking loose as if it's a heavy coat and it, you have been wearing it for too long. It is drenched in whatever it is that you need to let go of. Its pockets are overflowing with it and it is such a weight on your shoulders. You can't wait to get rid of it. So visualize taking off that coat and letting it fall down on the ground behind you and look over your shoulder down at that coat and realize that you no longer need that thing and take a step forward and leave it behind you. Finally, you can move forward, feel dopamine come back into your system. You might feel lighter. As I said, you might feel more free. The exercise is there for whenever you need it, whenever you feel blocked, frustrated, overwhelmed. If you want to calm your mind, focus on the future. Sometimes I do it really fast just to shift my mindset between different types of conversations. Be patient with yourself. You might, as I said, you might have to do it several times. Major losses can take time to let go. So I'm going to move us past endurance and just ask you quickly to drop in the chat things that you're going to take away from what we have covered today. What are some of the techniques that jumped out at you that you want to try? Open the chat. Remembering to shake it out after stressful situations. It is, you know, people, again, you might, you're going to do it in the privacy of your own home. Jenny also says letting go. Sam, anything that jumps out for you? Jody, anything that is top of mind? Diaphragmatic breathing, Logan, yes. And that's the starting point. Without the diaphragmatic breathing and then layer in the paced breathing, right? Breathe diaphragmatically and then get that paste breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing alone isn't going to release the DHEA. You need the paste breathing. Visualizing your eye, yes, with different situations. Having that wardrobe of eyes, Sam, that's great. So whatever it is that you take away, I recommend that you habit stack it into your day so that you attach it to something that you already do like brushing your teeth, you might want to do a map of tension while you brush your teeth or start your paced breathing while you brush your teeth or while you make a cup of coffee. Stack it next to something you do every day until it becomes habit. Only try to tackle a few. And then once they're part of your routine, you can add a few more. So did any questions come in, Jenny, that I should field? No, I think we're good. I think. All right. Well, choosing just a few techniques will enable you to help mixing, mix your winning cocktail and live your life on the left-hand side of that grid with more credits than debits in the PI balance sheet. And remember, it all starts here in our bodies because physiology powers our performance, the body and the brain inextricably linked. So thank you. I wish you all physically intelligent futures. And if you have any questions, you can reach me through the information that will be in the slide deck that we'll send out in a few days. Have a great evening. Thanks for staying late. A big thank you, Pat. Uh, thanks for your, your, your time, your expertise, and most importantly, your flexibility. We appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for being here and for with the, uh, with the same traits. Uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to Pat in Emerge, emerge.emerson.edu. Uh, that's where you'll also find the recording of this event in a few days when the recording has been posted. Everyone who registered will receive an email about that, and that email will also include the materials Pat is referencing. So uh, some, some places to follow up, more information about her and the slide deck. You'll also give see you some extra, an email so. with, a, with a link to a survey. We hope you'll fill that out. Um, thanks again for coming tonight and have a great night. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, team. And I'll send you all extras because we had to cut a little bit out.